Hello and welcome to the Royal BC Museum and to our program, our online program today called Creep, Crawl and Slither. Uh, we are the Royal BC Museum. The Royal BC Museum is located on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. Uh, and we're every, every move that we make here at the museum is grounded in where we are in our place uh, on these lands and being able to live and learn uh, alongside the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. So the Royal BC Museum, if you have never been here before, is that little dot in all of Canada at the very uh, corner of Canada. And we are on, a, on an island. We are the, in the province of British Columbia on the, uh, the island of Vancouver Island at the very bottom, uh, Victoria, uh, the city of Victoria. And this is the, the front of our museum. So uh, you'll see off to the right uh, is where we are right now. Uh, that's our collection tower. So we're right now on the sixth floor of that big tower to the right and to the left is our exhibitions building. Um, so just imagine you're virtually, I, and I know that there are classes from Nanaimo and from Florida and from Ontario uh, and from the Okanagan all over North America. Imagine that digitally you are walking through the doors right now. Oh, and from Montana, Missoula, Montana. <laughs> so. Um, imagine that you're walking through the doors and you are now in the collection tower of the Royal BC Museum. And the, the Royal BC Museum is a natural and human history museum. It's the provincial museum for British Columbia. So if it, if it lives and has a story and history in British Columbia, it's our responsibility here at the museum to work with communities to better understand uh, the things that live and the things that have a story in British Columbia. Today, because we're almost a couple days away from Halloween, we wanted to look at a couple of animals that you might see uh, during these days leading up to Halloween. Um, and to do that, I've invited two of my colleagues uh, here at the museum, my friends here at the museum, uh, that study the kind of animals that you might see during Halloween. And we're even gonna be doing some drawing today. So, um, so get your pencil and paper or marker and paper uh, ready to do some drawing as we go along. Again, my name is Chris O'Connor. I'm a learning program developer here at the Royal BC Museum. And my first friend that I'm gonna introduce you to is Joel Gibson. So I'm gonna turn the camera around and Joel is gonna come dramatically into the, into the view. And um, so Joel, Dr. Joel Gibson is a curator of entomology here at the museum. Um, so Joel, hello, welcome. Hi folks. <laughs> so what is that? That's a big word, entomology. What does entomology That means I work on insects and things that are really similar to insects. So spiders and millipedes and centipedes are all kind of close to insects. So I work with all of those types of things. So you're the one at the museum that, one of the people at the museum that studies insects and tries to understand that. And then are you bringing insects into the collection? Yep, we look at insects out across British Columbia. We also have a lot of things that are in the collection and it's a great chance for us to learn about what different types of insects and spiders we have and where they live and what sorts of things they do in the province. Great, so the collection, what, let's, let's look at some of what you have in the collection here. Oh, when, we I, when, we, when we say collection, what does that mean? Well, there's over a million things that we have here and all of them are different and all of them have important information. And it's great for when we wanna to talk to folks and do a tour like this, but also we'll have scientists and people come in and want to learn things about the province, then we have a lot of things in our collection that tell us details about where things live and what they do. Well, wow. that sounds like a great job. Oh, so it's let's, a lot of fun. <laughs> so let's go into, this is your lab space yep. here in the collection. We have a big fun lab space. It's a real scientist lab space. We have microscopes, we've got equipment, and we really use it. This isn't just for a movie. This is really what we do every day. And you said there are one million things, uh, yes. specimens is the, the fancy word that we use, right? The fancy thing we use is every one of them we call a specimen. So we have an example of things like this, which are moths, which I thought was kind of appropriate for Halloween because they fly around at night and people think about spooky nighttime stuff. So moths fly around at night and each of these are one specimen that we can learn about and we can know their name and we can see all the different features that are on them. Now these are nice and big and you can see them even with a, a phone camera like this, but you can also look under the microscope to look really, really close at them. 
And some, some people watching might say, are they alive? These ones are not alive. And a lot of the stuff we do out in the field, we work with alive stuff and we'll take photographs or we'll take videos to study them. And some of them are back here in the collection and they aren't alive and we work with them that way. So we're looking at moths. What else, what else can we Well, like? I thought, since Chris, you said creepy crawly stuff, which is not bad. I like to think of creepy and crawlies also can be fun. It's just the way they move. So things that creep and crawl could be millipedes like this. This is a millipede which has so many legs. Look at that. Imagine all of those legs moving at the same time. That's how they would crawl because they crawl on this. And millipede means a thousand feet. Now this doesn't actually have a thousand feet, but it's a lot of feet. But with a specimen like this, you could count to see how many feet. You could count. And actually one thing I do know is each one of these rings, you see it's made up of all these different ring body parts. Each ring has four legs on it. There's two on one side and two on the other. That's how you know it's a millipede. It makes me think a little bit of rings of a tree. Does the ring does the rings say how old it is or they will get bigger and every time they grow, they'll kind of shed their skin and get a little bigger and get a little bigger. There is a maximum size. At some point, that's as many segments as they have. And some of them don't have any very many, maybe only the eight or ten. This one has more like I'd say closer to 30. Mm -hmm. Funny thing here is you can you see which side is the head and which side is the tail? Mm. Oh, that's a trick. So one. you this could put in the head. chat. Oh, I was gonna, I was gonna say they could put in the chat which one they think is the, the head and which is the tail. Yeah, see that. And another creepy crawly thing sometimes people think about are spiders. And here's a nice picture so you can see one. This is like a black widow spider, and people think it's scary, but it's not really that scary. It lives on a web, and it likes to eat other things. So that's what it does. Now it does crawl around and it does creep. So that makes it creepy and crawly, but that doesn't make it bad. It just likes to crawl around. I have a question, Joel. So I see in this picture, there's a red dot mm -hmm. on it. What, it. what is the red dot? It's just, it's funny. I don't know what it's for. It's just, that's how you know it's a black widow. That it's all black with a red dot underneath its belly. So when it's crawling and you only see its back, you usually don't see it, but you see a black red dot on the inside. Uh -huh. And so that's how some... we can tell what things are. Is usually some little color thing or some little shape that tells us what kind it is. And even though you study insects and spiders and scientists study insects and spiders, sometimes we just don't know. Well, it's, it's funny because I don't know when one spider sees another one, that red dot means something to them. Yeah, I don't know right. what it means. Yeah, it's nice to have some mystery with. Oh, there's with... lots of mysteries. <laughs> and there's lots of different spiders too. If you look here, these are a lot smaller ones, but there's lots of different types that we see. see. And these are the types of little vials that we'll store them in. And you see that little piece of paper that's with it? That tells us where we found it, what day, who it was, in case we need to go back and ask more questions about, well, what was this spider doing? Was it on a web? Was it eating something? Was it in the winter? There's lots of things we can learn about each one of these specimens. So, so what would we see on those, um, on the piece of paper, what would it say? This piece of paper says this one was collected on White Lake, British Columbia in, what year is it? 1995, oh boy, that was a long time ago. <laughs> and what kind of spider is that? This one, I don't know, this one hasn't, we haven't identified it yet. So we have a lot of spiders that we have to take time and look through books and ask other friends that might know about it. And they help us to identify what kind they are. But some, some things we do know, like we know how many spiders there are in British Columbia. How many There's like over 900 different species. Just in British Columbia. Just in British Columbia. And you think, oh my goodness, that's going to be giant spiders everywhere, covering houses. No, most of the spiders are smaller than your fingernails. Most of those species never get very big and all they do is eat little insects in the soil and you never see them. So we have friends visiting us from Montana and from Florida and Ontario. Um, those spiders that are in British Columbia, would some of those spiders be in other places as well? Yep, some spiders are the types that are kind of found everywhere in the world. And usually those are the ones that are in houses. Um, some spiders only live in some certain spots, like maybe only where it's really hot or where it's a desert or at the top of a mountain. 
So they'll only be found in certain spots. And some spiders, you kind of find them all over the place. So um, if, you're, if you're watching and you have any questions about um, moths or millipedes or spiders, feel free to put that in the chat. Um, and in the meantime, as we're waiting for some questions, um, Joel, can you draw, so help us draw, if we were gonna draw our own um, creature, how best can we do that? What well, can we the great thing about insects and millipedes and spiders is there's a lot of things that are different colors and different shapes. If you can think of a shape or a color that makes sense, there's probably one out there that has it. So go ahead, use whatever color you want. And then just to be able to say, well, did I draw a spider or did I draw an insect or did I draw a millipede? There's just a few things to know. So with an insect. So in your classroom, feel free to have a piece of paper and a pencil and you can just draw along with, with Joel as, as we go. And I'm just gonna draw what I like to draw, which is insects and spiders and millipedes. So with an insect, you just gotta remember three body parts and wings. So you have a head. So this is like the moths we looked at. It has a head, it has a body, and then it has a tail. Three parts, but all of the wings, which these ones, we did, they had long pointy wings and then a shorter wing and then a long pointy wing and then a shorter wing. So four wings, one, two, three, four. And the legs come out of the body too. One, two, three, four, five, six. And they all come out of the body part. So all of the legs and all of the wings come out of the body part. And on the head, go ahead, make long frilly antenna if you want. Because a lot of moths have frilly antenna or feathery antenna and they can have big eyes or they can have small eyes. There you go, that's an insect. Now it's a moth like the ones we were looking at, but if you want to do any other type of insect, you could make it have bigger wings or smaller wings or different colors. So speaking of wings, we have a question from the chat. Why do uh, moths have fur on their wings? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, one of the things, and this is one of those things scientists think they know, but one neat thing is that A, it can keep them warm, that it's kind of furry and they fly at night when it gets a little bit colder. So it actually insulates their wings so they don't get as cold. And the other thing is they think it may actually change sound. So bats, when they try to find moths at night, they use sound and the fur on the wings actually makes it harder for bats to find them, mm. which that's only something in the last few years, scientists are like, wait a minute. If you, you can't hear a moth because it's fuzzy. Mm. And bats are another, Thing of Halloween. So it's all, all it's all other. connected, right? <laughs> and I think we're putting into the chat, uh, we just created a new uh, animation about bats uh, in our on our learning portal. And uh, the bats are, uh, the animation shows around about equilocation. Yeah. Um, so maybe the moths found out about that and learned yeah. to- They heard about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so how about, can we draw one more? Let's draw one, one more thing. How about a spider and how you know if someone's like, are you drawing an insect or are you drawing a spider? And you can say to them, I'm drawing a spider because it only has two body sections. So it's got a head and then it's got a body. And you're like, well, where do the legs go? Well, spiders don't have wings, so you don't have to worry about that. But on a spider, the eyes are on the head and sometimes they have more than two eyes. Sometimes they have like eight eyes. And they've got mouth parts, but all of their legs come out of the side of their head, which you can think about how amazing that would be if instead of ears, you had legs coming out of the side of your head. That's what spiders have. So when you see you draw an insect and you draw a spider, they're very different, mostly because the legs come out of the head on a spider. And one has three parts and one has two parts. That's right. So why eight? eyes or you said there's molt sometimes yep. spiders have a different range of different eyes it's a great question and you think like maybe spiders can see things really well maybe they can see things at night maybe they can see things that are moving because most spiders are predators so they're always trying to grab little insects that are trying to get away 
So they have to have really good vision to be able to track them down or to see something that goes into the web. So I think they have so many eyes so that they can see things really fast. So Caroline in the chat asks, Joel, do you have a favorite spider species? The spiders? I like a lot of spiders. I like the, the Black Widow just because it looks so neat. It's black and it's shiny and it looks kind of Halloween-y. But there's a lot of other spiders that when I kind of see them out and there's kind of a fuzzy one running across a beach, I'm always like, oh, that's spiders out there trying to hunt something. So I find all of them kind of cute because they're small and they run quickly. Um, Lise uh, says, why do spiders, or asks, why do spiders, um, sorry, just a second. Why do spiders spread webs all over? Oh, that's a really good question. A lot of spiders use their web, which is this sticky stuff that they can make in their bodies because it's sticky. And when they do that, they can put a stick, either a big flat web. Some of them have like patch of it on the ground. Some of it just shoot at one strand at a time. And it's to stick to things so that they can catch them and eat them. It's sort of like their little lasso or their rope to catch things to eat. And I said that that was uh, Lise, but that was actually Julie who asked that. But Lise asked, why do spiders bite people sometimes? They do sometimes, but a lot of them can't. And usually, because if you think about it, you're way, way, way bigger than a spider. So the spider probably doesn't even know that it's biting a person. It's sort of like if a mountain was right next to you and you sort of push back at it with your hands, you're not punching a mountain, you're just hitting something that's way bigger than you. So the spiders aren't actually trying to bite a person. It's just something really big that their mouth happens to hit. And that, well, I was gonna ask you earlier. So sometimes people say that they're, a, they're afraid of spiders. Oh, yeah. And so what, what are some reasons why maybe think about them not as being as scary as well, they are? People are scared of things and it's okay to be scared of things. Um, but sometimes people are scared of things because they're not sure about them. And spiders, I find if you kind of they upset you or, or they're a little bit too scary for you, kind of stay away and watch them from a distance and see what they're doing. And usually this is how I kind of came to like spiders because I didn't used to like them either. But when I'd watch them, I would see them doing their things and I'm like, oh, now it's going over there to eat that. Or now it's crawling up that plant or now it's doing this. And you sort of start to see that it is doing things. And then it becomes a lot less scary when you see it just sort of living its life. So Tamara has a, a question about a specific kind of spider saying around trapdoor spiders. Oh, that's a how, great one to ask. About. How do they know when there is prey? That's a really good question. Cause you think, how would they know? Cause trapdoor spiders- live You want to draw what that looks like if they're- Yeah, oh, I can do that. Trapdoor and this spider. will be our last question. And then we're going to go meet our, our next friend. In the... Trapdoor spiders. So say you have the ground like this, they will dig a hole like this and then they'll spin a lid, a lid on it that's all made out of webs. And it literally is like a trap door. And the spider will sit under here and wait. But what they'll do is they'll have like one little web that kind of comes out here. And as soon as anything touches the web, they jump out and grab it. So it's sort of like they're in a little hiding place. It's sort of like hiding in a closet and waiting till someone comes by and jumping out and scaring them. Normally people do that with sound or hearing. They can do it by feeling something touch the web. So as soon as something touch the webs, they jump out. And I was talking about the um, animation about bats. We also have an animation about specific folding door spiders. Very similar. They yeah. kind of do similar, similar yeah. things. Yeah, so you could see a little bit with, with that species. So the trap door is not that uh, something that they want to eat comes and falls through the trap door. No, the trap door is more as a hiding place, right? It's a hiding place to jump out and scare people. <laughs> so, um, Joel, we're going to walk up to the next floor. Yeah. Um, and so thank you so much for showing how to draw a, a moth and how to draw a spider and the difference between the two. Um, I did see, as we're walking, um, I did see another question, especially as I was looking at the picture of the spider. Uh, someone asks, why do they their legs come out of their, their head? The I don't know. It's a really good question because they only have two body parts. So I guess they have to come out somewhere. But I think that probably changes the way that they walk. And maybe that's why spiders look like they walk differently because their legs are in a different place. 
Um, Julie asks, actually, there's two questions. Why do some spiders die after they have babies? And then why do spiders have big bellies? Ooh, big bellies is a big question. And I think it's because their big belly actually has their stomach where they have to digest food, but it also has all the stuff to generate the webs. So there's a lot of stuff in that belly. So that takes up big space. That's a good question. And then a lot of spiders don't live for very long. So they don't die just because they have babies. It's just that they only live a certain time. They have the babies and that's as long as they live. So thank you so much, Joel. As you're, as you're noticing, we're here, I'm just gonna turn the camera around. As you're noticing where we went upstairs. So we're in a, our collection tower. We were on the sixth floor and now we're going to the seventh floor to meet our next friend. So Joel was the, is the curator of entomology and we are about to meet Gavin. Nice. We're not using AirPods. So. Oh, we're, not? Um, okay. <laughs> we're meeting Dr. Gavin Henke, who's our curator of vertebrate zoology. Um, and Joel is here too, so we'll, um, but we're meeting with uh, Gavin now because we were, Gavin, we were just looking at some spiders and some millipedes. Um, and some moths, because we're thinking about Halloween and some of the creepy things you might see around Halloween. You have some creepy things, but first, you're the curator of vertebrate zoology. So what does yes. that mean? Vertebrate zoology, uh, that's the study of animals with backbones. So mm. I, I cover all that. Birds, mammals, fish, amphibians, and reptiles. So everything with a backbone except for humans. Except for people, yeah. Right. I don't study people. Right. <laughs> So that's a lot of different things. Huh? A lot, yeah. Joel was saying that there's a million things in his collection. Do you? I, I don't have anywhere near that much. <laughs> Some of my things are big. Yeah, so much I, bigger. I look after whales. Right. But then it's sometimes it's tiny little fish. Right. So yeah, I've got a huge size range, but not as much diversity, not as many species, and uh, yeah, they, some of my things can't be put in a nice little box. Right. But uh, hundreds of thousands. If you count every individual, yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So I I pulled out an assemblage here that of, of nice creepy things that might make you think about Halloween. I mean, who hasn't heard an eye of Newt in a um, you know uh, in a cauldron? And this is our local Newt. This is the rough skin Newt. So normally when they're alive, they're chocolatey brown on the back, and the belly's bright orange, and that orange color when they feel threatened, they'll show that off. And the whole point is to remind you that they're toxic. So uh -huh. th these are toxic, you wouldn't want to eat one, but there are snakes here that are immune to it. Mm. But you can touch it okay. Mm -hmm. It's just if you were to eat it, then. Yes, exactly. When, when I was a little kid, I had a California Newt as a pet, which is very much like this. Oh yeah. And uh, yeah, his name was Isaac Newton, of course. <laughs> yeah, and he, he lasted a good seven to 10 years, if I remember, he was mm. a great pet. Yeah, love these guys. And of course, my other favorite for Halloween. Yes. Big toads, <laughs> who hasn't seen that in a, in a story? This is our Western toad. It's, um, this is a good sized one. I actually, uh, years ago I was camping and I heard a rustling in the bush and we expected it to be something like a skunk based on the noise. And it turns out it was just a really big toad mm -hmm. climbing through the leaves. So we have uh, friends visiting us from Montana, from mm -hmm. Florida, from Ontario, and then closer from Nanaimo mm -hmm. and the uh, Okanagan. Uh, where would you find this kind of toad? This toad you, is it just in BC or is it No, elsewhere? you'll find these in Alberta as well. They're, it's Western Canada, Western North America. Um, yeah. So, so potentially quite, Montana too. Also, I haven't looked at the maps for Montana, but it's possible, yeah. They've got other toads down there as well. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a, actually quite a diversity of toads across across the country and across the continent. Um, further east you go, you get the Canadian toad and the American toad. They look a lot alike. They don't get quite as big, but you look at the, the pattern of the bumps and the crests yeah. on the head, and that tells you what species you've got. What's the reason for the bumps? Well, this big bump right here, just behind the eye, that's a poison gland. Mm. And uh, other there's other glands in the skin as well, and they, you know, not only does it contain poison, but it also gives it a rocky look. So it's, it's camouflage as well. Right. These guys come in browns, grays, greens. So they're, they're quite colorful. Um, a weird thing about toads, when they die, the poison just sort of eases out of those glands. So you'll see little, little 
spots of white liquid when uh -huh. the, uh, that just releases when the glands when, uh -huh. the, when the when the toad dies, and it it kind of smells like burnt rubber to me when you smell the the, the actual poison. Very bizarre. And I'm just looking at the old toes right now. Yeah. So it looks like on one side there's three and on the other side there's four. Is that? Oh, no. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Just... They don't have as heavy a webbed foot as a frog would have. So these guys, they're not so much a hopper. They're more of a crawler. Uh, they will hop if they have to, but uh, toads most of the time crawl along. I actually like toads. Yeah. <laughs> I, it, they just look like grumpy old men to me. That's, right. <laughs> I think they, and I, I can, I can relate to right, that. Right, right. Yeah. And not just during Halloween. Not just, no, no, no. This, this is another, it's, it's, you, you might've heard of these. People call them horned toads. They're actually lizards uh -huh. and very similar. You can understand why someone would call it a horned toad. It's depending on the species, they have little, spikes off the back of their head so they look like they almost have little horns mm. this is a pygmy short horned lizard so it doesn't have large horns further south in the united states you'll see species down there with much more prominent horns on them and they get much bigger uh -huh. this is a tiny one so this is a species that's thought to be gone from british columbia it's just south of us um, but the la this is the last one that was found in british columbia uh, and i think it was 1898 Wow. So this is an old specimen and that's full grown. So uh, I'd love to get out there and have a look around because I, I think these guys, they're so camouflaged with all the little prickles on their skin. They, they would blend into gravel so well. Yeah. I think they may be overlooked. I think they're probably here. So Kaylin asks, why do toads have poison in their bodies? It's to stop predators from eating them. If something's poisonous or even tastes really bad, then a predator won't eat it. It's uh -huh. as simple as that. When you pick up a garter snake, it's disgusting, but they pee all over you. Uh -huh. And that smells so bad, it might make a predator drop it. Mm. Some birds throw up on you if you grab them. So yeah, if, if you taste bad, you won't be eaten. And Caitlin was also asking, why do frogs hop? It, any also maybe reasons. to get away from Yeah, to get predator. away from a predator, to get from A to B, to jump at food. So they'll lunge forward to grab as, as well as flick out their tongue to grab food. Yeah. Um, Julie asks, why do horned toads have spikes? Again, it's, I think it's just camouflage. Mm. I don't think it helps them in any other way. It helps them blend in. It breaks up their outline so that they don't look like a nice streamlined little lizard. Mm. And when they sit down in gravel, they're really hard to spot. And keep in mind, the babies are about the size of your thumbnail. Right. A little bigger than that, maybe. But they would they would look like a little pebble if you're walking and if they sit still you'd walk right past them. right hopefully not, not walk on them oh yeah for sure yeah <laughs> so you have some other things here oh yeah i mean people love you know when you think creepy crawly snakes i mean everyone wants to see a rattlesnake or some sort of venomous snake so this is our this is the rattlesnake rattler. yeah now it's got a tiny little rattle so and this specimen was in alcohol it was preserved in alcohol so the rattle won't make noise so I brought a skin here. Ah. This is a dried skin, and I hope the sound picks up. So that's what you'd hear when a rattlesnake is near you. <laughs> and it's not the snake coming to get you, it's the snake warning you to stay away. Right. And all, all you do, find the snake and back away. Right. No problem. <laughs> It's very nice of the snake to... Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> they don't want to waste venom on something as big as you. They right. want to they eat a mouse or something small. Yeah, this, oh, is, a, this um, is a skin of a prairie rattlesnake from Alberta. Liz was asking if you could rattle it again. Oh, sure. <laughs> I, I, am, I am backing away right now. <laughs> Um, so this is kind of interesting because you have a full body of a snake and then just the skin of a yeah. snake. So what, why, why might you collect things in different ways like that? Well, sometimes the, it also depends on who collected it. So some people may just want the skin for DNA or someone may want the whole body. I normally collect the whole body. You never know what someone's going to study. They may want a piece of liver. They may want to see what's in its stomach. They want to see if it's male or female. If, it, if it's about to reproduce or not. Uh -huh. So 
so yeah, some I would prefer to take the whole body. The skin can only tell you so much. So we have a question, how big can snakes get in BC? Our biggest, our longest is, is the, the gopher snake. And I can't remember their length uh, off the top of my head. Uh, we have had rat snakes found loose here in BC and they're, they're a good five feet long. Mm. So they're, they're, they're big snakes. Right. Good chunky things, yeah. But most snakes that you would see in BC are? Most, yeah, our, our garter snakes are by far the most common and they're about a, a meter. So okay. I'm, I'm mixing feet and meters, I'm right. sorry. Right. <laughs> I, I, I sort of straddle that. Yeah, no, well, we have, we have visitors yeah, from, yeah, yeah. Yeah. from the US and from Canada. Yeah. So. And I thought I'd bring in some creepy fish as well. This is a fang tooth. These are deep sea fish. They're all flabby and soft. They're slow swimmers. And uh, I mean, the reason for those teeth, it's not to just look scary because down in the depths, it's so dark. Your, your prey cannot see you. They don't know what you look like. But those teeth are there just so you can grab every opportunity. If, if food comes by, those teeth will help you grab it and nothing's getting away. Mm. Same with the spikes on the top? Uh, no, that's actually the dorsal fin. And it's really soft. It's not even a spike that would prevent this fish from being eaten mm. by something larger. It's more just to help with swimming. Yeah, just for swimming. They're kind of bristly, very strange skin texture on this on these guys. Mm. And there's another fish here, uh -huh. another deep sea fish. I'll put this one down. Speaking of not being able to see. Yeah, this is a type of dreamer fish or an angler fish. I hope you got it lined up there. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, how to describe this? They're basically a flabby bag of skin and they have very short little fins. They float along. They're all mouth and you can see little teeth in there. And they float along just waiting for food to come along. And then they, they have their, their dorsal fin is modified. And at the tip of this little appendage, it, well, it lights up. Mm. So it's like a fishing rod or a lure, and it just flaps around in front. And then as something comes to eat that, there's a bigger mouth to eat something that was about to eat that. Uh, so, so that other, other animals are interested in the light to eat e it? Exactly. Uh -huh. so here's a fish that goes fishing. Right. <laughs> you can and, see it in the camera, but that's the eye. It's a tiny yeah. little eye. You know, down at the depths when it's so dark, there's really not much point for eyes. Yeah. Or for... Look, I guess there's certain people would think this is beautiful. <laughs> I have a colleague down in the United States. He's, he wrote the book on these guys. So yeah. yes, he loves them. Yeah. There's actually one of these that, I mean, just have a look at that. It, it looks like a hockey puck. Right. There is one and the Latin name is puck. It is, it's based on, because it looks like a hockey puck. And I thought that was hilarious. So one of the questions is what happens if they're waiting and then no one, nothing comes by? Well, and I mean, everything can starve to death, but you're talking, this is a fish with a very low metabolism and it's normally used to getting very few meals a, a year. So animals like this, unlike us, like we need to eat regularly because we produce so much heat. We waste a lot of heat actually. Um, these guys can get by on very little food. Mm. A garter snake can get by on just a few frogs a year. Mm. You know, when you think about only eating a few times a year, it's, it's so different than our, our metabolism. And how does it light, light, light up? Like what's, how does that um, work? Yeah, basically it's, it's, uh, there's a, there's a phosphorescent, I think, it, I assume it's just phosphorescent bacteria in there or something, mm. um, bioluminescent, and it just completely lights up in a sort of a bluey green color. Yeah. There are other fish with pores in their skin that, that actually glow red. Mm. It's really cool. But it's one of those things you don't get to see live because by the time this comes from, two kilometers depth up to the surface of the ocean, it's dead. And so it's not lighting up anymore. And unless you're lucky enough to go down in a submersible and then turn off the lights, that's mm. the only way you'd see it. And I think Liz just put in the chat, uh, uh, a, uh, or a, a Jenny just put in the chat, uh, uh, article about them. Yeah, nice, nice. For yeah. National Geographic. We did have a question earlier about the snakes. Mm -hmm. How how do you know if a snake is a is male or female? Ah. What's the age group we're dealing with? What is that? <laughs> Cater to. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, um, snakes, you can always tell a male from a female by the length of the tail. Uh. And 
That's, that's it, one way of doing it. And you can just count scales. And a longer tail is male, a shorter tail is female. Mm. This is actually a sea snake. So it's even harder to see on a sea snake. Uh. Uh, this is a sea snake that's actually normally in California, as far north as California. But this one arrived here in a ship's ballast water. So uh -huh. when the ship pumped out the water, they found this. Uh -huh. So a bit of a surprise for British Columbia. We, we normally don't get them this far north, but it's a sea snake and it's venomous. Now I can show you on the rattlesnake very quickly. That's a boy. So just, uh -huh. yeah. So they, they do have a penis just like other, other, other vertebrates. Mm -hmm. And here's the weird part about snakes and lizards. They have two of them. Oh. So yes, um, it's pretty obvious to tell male from female. Two for a reason? Uh, I suppose it depends on what side the male and female line up when uh -huh. they mate. Uh -huh. um, right. Yeah, and it's, it's a very bizarre adaptation. Yeah, yeah. So when we were talking with Joel, he was showing us some spiders in jars with mm -hmm. liquid. And I'm just noticing that there's all these jars with liquid. That's where we were just looking at. Those yeah. things came out of the jars yeah, with every liquid. Every jar has a label saying what it is, where it's from, and a catalog number so that we can uh, cross-reference all the information that's on the label. Uh -huh. You'll notice some of those jars have different color alcohol. If it gets really oily, it tends to get yellow like that. And what we try to do is swap out, swap out the alcohol with something a little more fresh so it's cleaner. Um, if, the, if the alcohol gets really oily like that one is, it, the specimen can eventually break down over time. So you wanna okay. keep the alcohol as fresh as possible. Great. Um, Joel, are you still here? I'm here. Yeah, great. <laughs> as we're finishing up, do you wanna sit, stand next to Gavin there? In front of the last thing that we haven't looked at yet, which is it's because because of Halloween. It's Halloween. It's a cat. We just happen to have this cat skeleton in the museum's collection. I have no idea why. Oh yeah. <laughs> no idea why we have this. Right. It's it's a domestic cat. It's from a company that sells skeletons to oh, okay. universities and schools. So it's a very bizarre object right. for us to have because it really doesn't relate to BC other than people have pet cats. Yeah. <laughs> And Halloween. And it's Halloween. Yeah. So um, in our last couple of minutes, you, you, thank you both for showing us some of the things in your collection. It's just a very small amount of the specimens that you have. Why, why is it important to have these things in a museum? Well, it's important because lots of people have questions about the things that live in a place. And everywhere you go, I mean, Florida has collections and Montana has collections and Ontario has collections. So when people want to know about the stuff that live in British Columbia, they got to ask us. And then we check in the collection to be able to say, these animals live here, these animals live there, these animals used to live here, and now we don't know where yeah, they like, are. Yeah, like Gavin was just talking about. Yeah. With what, what this, was... This is a historical record that is priceless. You, you can't go back in time to catch them again. So if nobody bothered to save this and preserve it, we would have no record of this animal in British Columbia. Yeah other than maybe photographs. I, I haven't seen any photographs. There are some drawings, but that's not solid evidence. And again, because we're have, we have visitors, uh, we have friends from Montana and Florida and Ontario. It's also interesting to know what's specific about British Columbia mm -hmm. and how that's different, but also maybe similar to my, um, other areas of North America and the world how and how changing. things are changing. Yeah. yeah, that's the biggie. Yeah. Yeah, you can't, you can't, you can't figure out how things are changing if you don't know how things used to be. Great. Um, and just, uh, just before we begin, uh, be just before we end, um, Jenny, if you can share those two last slides. So this slide is uh, has your photos, <laughs> so Joel and Gavin. Um, so if you want to know more about things that creep and crawl, so entomology, contact Dr. Joel Gibson. So the, the his email is there. And then if you want to ask about things that are that slither and and do more than slither, <laughs> um, uh, definitely contact uh, Gavin about that. So his email is there as well. And Jenny's going to share those in the chat also. And the last slide is um, 
about us here in learning. So we, uh, if you want to book, a, we do many different kinds of uh, digital field trips uh, all around the museum with all different kinds of uh, topics and themes. So that's our um, email and our, our, the place on our website that you could find out more about our digital field trips. And we also have a learning portal, um, which is a great website with lots of different uh, information about the museum and the collections and the things that you would find in, in the museum. Uh, and some of the animations that I mentioned earlier are there as well. All right, so I'm going to uh, turn the camera around. We'll stop sharing. And, and all from all three of us at the Royal BC Museum, thank you so much for your great questions. So many great questions about uh, the for entomology and vertebrate zoology that we heard about. So thank you so much for joining us. And until next time, bye. <laughs>